100 years of Anzac, the spirit lives on. 2014-2018. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Wally Harm, I'm your Master of Ceremonies for this morning's service. The Queen's Rocks RSL sub-branch wishes to be, uh, bid you welcome. I find it's a great privilege to carry out these duties on this momentous occasion. For 17 years I've been coming along here conducting these services. This is one of my proudest. Thanks for having me. We'll start this morning's service with the President of the RSL, uh, the Queen's Rocks RSL sub-branch, Mr Peter Loftale, to give the official welcome. Mr Loftale. Thank you, Wally. First of all, thank you for undergoing uh, such a few hassles. As I look out, I can see a sea of faces. We expected a large crowd, but we didn't expect as many as we have. Thank you for your attendance. To our distinguished guests, members of the Australian Defence Force, past and present, and to members of our allied Defence Force, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I welcome you. I won't waffle on, but I do have two letters that I would like to read to you. The first one is from our Prime Minister, and it reads, Today we mark the centenary of the landing at Gallipoli. In the early dawns of the 25th of April, 1915, Australian troops came ashore at Anzac Cove. It was a Sunday, and here in Australia, people attended church, children played in the, back, in the backyard footy, and families came together to share a meal. That day and throughout the Gallipoli campaign, our forebearers faced trials scarcely imagined to those that they had left behind. On the day of the landing, some 750 Australians were killed, more than 8,700 Australians would lose their lives before the evacuation, the only successful part of the campaign eight months later. Many of those who fought at Gallipoli went on to serve on the Western Front. There, led by St. John, Saint, Sir John Monash, perhaps the finest Allied General, and inspired by the Anzac spirit, our soldiers helped turn the tide of war. It was a war in which our nation's identity was fought. In the magnificent defeat at Gallipoli, to the terrible, oh, sorry, to the terrible victories on the Western Front, and in the successful advances in the Middle East. Wherever they fought, our servicemen and women embodied the commitment to freedom, the spirit of adventure and the bonds of mateship that we hold dear to this day. Their courage and sacrifice leaves us the enduring enduring legacy of a free and peaceful nation. 
Their example is emulated by those who have served our country since and who are now on active duty in the Middle East and elsewhere. This Anzac Day, as the last post echo echoes across the memorial and park, battlefields and beaches, we honour all Australians who have served in our armed forces and rededicate ourselves to the country we love, lest we forget. The second letter is from our Premier and it reads, this year marks the centenary since Australia and New Zealand soldiers landed on the Gallipoli Peninsula in the early hours of the 25th of April 1915. It was a significant event for both countries. A number of Western Australian battalions served during the Gallipoli campaign, notably the 11th and 16th Battalion and the 10th Light Horse, as per the slouch hat. It is anticipated that an unprecedented number of people will attend this year's Anzac Day service across Western Australia. It will be an opportunity for many to pause and reflect on the more than 102,000 Australians who have died in wars. However, the centenary of Anzac commemoration is also about acknowledging our recent veterans and we express our gratitude to your members who have contributed so much towards the way of life we enjoy today. We would be grateful if you could circulate this letter to your members, Colin Barnett, MLA Premier. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, for, <coughs> thanks very much, Peter. Fantastic. I'd like to call on Mr. Justin Tonti, the musical director at uh, Peter Moyes Anglican College, uh, for the uh, acknowledgement of country. Thanks, Wally. Uh, I'm sure you've all been on the beaches here. I'm sure you've felt the sand coming through your toes as you walk on the beach. I'm sure right now you can stop your foot on the ground and then through your shoe, feel that land underneath your toes. It is an enormous privilege for me to acknowledge the Wajak people and their ongoing contribution to our community, to our society, and to who we are. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call on Uduru Nunakal, uh, thank you, for the uh, Dawn Wail for the Dead, a lovely poem, thank you. Dawn Wail for the Dead. Dim light of daybreak now, faintly over the sleeping camp. First thing every dawn, remember the dead, cry for them. <coughs> Softly at first her wail begins. One by one as they wake and hear, join in the cry and the whole camp wails for the dead, the poor dead, gone from here to the dark place. They are remembered. Then it is over, life now, fires lit, laughter now, and a new day is calling. Thank you very much. To be followed now for the Anzac Prayer 2001, which is a lovely poem, to be read by Russ Lapia Hamona. Thank you. This walk in 
the hills, April sun drenched as far as the eye can see. Clear across Rakawa to Kaikoura Heights and heavens above is my prayer for you, dearest departed friends. This bush track stroll far from the jungles we knew in Malaya and Borneo and on to Vietnam, peaceful and silent, my remembrance and time for you, comrade, coming raised in arms. These autumn leaves gathered and scattered willy-nilly as I roam, nowhere in particular, wandering memories away. In distant reflections are my flowers for you, brave and noble men. This mad descent off the hills to the shore, stretching legs to the limit, bursting hearts and lungs, shouting defence to the skies, till my body cries enough is my song for you, song to you, sons of the land. This is my home, my psalm, my song, my prayer. This is my Anzac parade in remembrance of you. Thanks very much. Lovely. We move on now to the wreath laying uh, part of our ceremony, ladies and gentlemen. And this year we'll be laying the wreaths along the steps around here. And to lead the way, I'd like to ask on the uh, president of the RSL sub-branch at Queen's Rocks, Mr Peter Lockdale, if we could start the uh, wreath presentation. Thank you. Thank you. 
students of the Butler College. Ladies and gentlemen, this particular stage, I'd like to call on the good uh, Reverend Gunas Balodas, thank you, to give us our prayer for the morning. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of the one true God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like you to listen to the words of St. John as written in the um, first letter of St. John, in the third chapter, beginning at the 11th verse. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Before we pray, I just want to vent some, a little bit of righteous anger, and that is about the direction which Anzac Day in some circles is taking. Just because it's 100 years, uh, it's no more or less important than what it was after one year, 10 years, or 50 years. <laughs>
the top. <laughs> I also see in society, in some, some circles, that society seems hell-bent on reducing what is arguably Australia's most important secular um, Remembrance Day to the circus, which is Easter and, and, uh, and also Christmas. It's the next big excuse for a celebration, which is perhaps a euphemism these days for ignoring what it actually means and making it into something completely different. Anzac Day must never ever be trivialised and it must be remembered with reverence and solemnity. Because those boys and those men who died shed real blood. They felt real pain. They felt real fear as rounds pierced their bodies and their agony was real, and many of them returned mentally scarred forever, and their families. Their sacrifice was real, and we should never, ever forget that in amongst all the paraphernalia which people now are trying to foist onto Anzac Day for commercial reasons in many instances. The sacrifice of Jesus was also very real for us. His sacrifice on the cross his bleeding for us. Not just for us, but also for those who died for our country. Died for you and also for me. So that we might live, not just here on earth, but that we might live also eternally. Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of our soldiers at Gallipoli and all theatres of war. Father, may we never forget, or we never ever forget the real meaning of Anzac Day, and may we never reduce it to a celebration, but may we remember it for what it was, a cruel and horrible thing. Thank you, Father, for the peace and security we enjoy through the courage of these men and women who died in the theatres of war. We pray especially, Father, for the, those soldiers and their families who are suffering even as we are here today as a result of all wars. We ask for your healing and we ask them that you would give them peace, peace which only you can give. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Thanks very much, Reverend. Thank you very much. We come to the uh, one of the most important parts of our service today is the uh, Anzac Day Address. And we're very, very fortunate this year to have Lieutenant Colonel Peter Wynne Stanley, um, OAM, JP, who is going to give our address today. Mr Wynne Stanley. Anzac Day is a day when we reflect on the men and women who paid the supreme sacrifice in order that we may enjoy our present lifestyle. When one considers World War I, that's a long, when one thinks it's a hundred years ago, we should remember that more than 400,000 Australians volunteered for military service there, and that was 10% of the population. 25 April, this Today is the 100th anniversary of the day in 1915 when at 4.29am Australian troops waded ashore in Turkey at a place now known as Anzac Cove. They were part of a combined force of Australians and New Zealanders known as Anzacs. This was not a campaign which would normally have been directly involved Anzacs. They were there in support of British troops the British landed at locations further north, known as Zubla Bay, and further south as at a place called Cape Pellis, where they suffered enormous casualties. Many lost their lives in that campaign, campaign which was a military disaster, the, which thankfully ended eight months later with the most successful withdrawal in military history. On day one of the battle, 
16,000 Australians were landed in the vicinity of a place called North Beach. And at the end of that day, 2,000 of that 16,000 were dead. The area of North Anzac Cove was the most rugged part of the entire Gallipoli Peninsula. Lieutenant Colonel John Monash, later Sir John Monash, who commanded the Australian troops on the Western Front with distinction, was commanding an element of the Anzac Invasion Force, which was to go to shore later. An extract from his diary of the 25th of April reads, and this is exactly out of his diary, at 2 p.m. we passed the entrance to the Dardanelles and witnessed the furious bombardment. At about 4 p.m. we came opposite Gaba Tepe and Anzac Cove and heard musketry from the ridges. At 7 p.m. the first boatload of wounded came alongside so they started to bring the people back and then followed a dreadful night. Over 700 wounded were taken aboard. About 11 p.m., an excited commander from a destroyer came alongside and yelled orders, lower all boats, ready for shore, in case the Admiral decides to embark the whole force. In other words, they've got to leave. You can see that on day one of the battle, things were going badly. And even at that stage, a withdrawal was being contemplated. It's worth considering the human cost of this battle. It's estimated that the Turks, our enemies, had over a quarter of a million casualties. It's a huge number. Many of those Turkish soldiers were peasant boys, some aged only about 14 years of age. The Allies put about half a million men into Turkey, and many became casualties, and of them it is estimated that about 46,000 died. The Australians had over 7,500 killed and nearly 20,000 wounded. The New Zealanders had 2,400 killed and 5,000 wounded. I have not been able to establish the number of casualties for the British forces, but it would have been many. The plan to invade Turkey was Winston Churchill's, who was then the first sea lord of the Admiralty. It was a man with a donkey, became f famous for his work as a stretcher bearer. <laughs> Using one of the donkeys brought in for carrying water, he transported wounded men day and night from the fighting in a place called Monash Valley to the beach at Anzac Cove. He did so according to the, world, the war historian Charles Bean through deadly sniping fire down the valley and the most furious shrapnel fire. He was killed on the 19th of May by machine gun fire while carrying two wounded men and he was buried on the beach. The first official commemoration of Anzac Day occurred in 1927 at the Cenotaph in Sydney. Up to that time small groups of survivors had got together to remember that day and to think of lost mates. Over the years, the nature of Anzac Day observances has changed from a focus exclusively on World War I to include World War II and campaigns in Malaya, Korea, Vietnam, and now extends to include campaigns involving Iraq, Afghanistan, Timor, and the Solomon Islands. It's worth reflecting on the fact that regardless of who wins, there are casualties on both sides in these conflicts. When a serviceman dies, somewhere a mother, a father, a spouse or a child loses a person close to them and they suffer extreme grief. Individuals as well as nations suffer. And that day is not a day for the glorification of war, but maybe it is fit to stop and think about the futility of war and hope that somewhere in the world there is a leader who will lead a worldwide pursuit of peace. But I suspect that is a fanciful thought. This now brings me back to my opening remark.
that the observance of Anzac Day is a time for us to reflect on the losses and sacrifices made by many and to think of them who have paid the supreme sacrifice. Lest we forget. Thank you very much, Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask everybody who isn't already to be upstanding, please, for the last post being played today by Mr. Jack Sirrett. Seated. As we move on now to get our vocal cords going here, we're going to uh, have the, the first of our hymns this morning, Abide With Me. Abide, in, Abide With Me was a poem written by a Scottish Angli uh, Anglican fellow, uh, Henry Francis Light, in 1847. It was set to, uh, um, it was set to English uh, by, by an English composer, William Henry Monk's tune entitled Even Tide. This morning, we're going to have a soloist from the Peter Moyes Anglican Community School, uh, namely Brandon Orgel, who is going to sing the first verse, whereby, if we could all join in for the second and subsequent verses. Thanks very much. Over to you, Brandon.
going on to the uh, next hymn, a bleak uh, 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 tune, uh, Waltzing Matilda. Now, Waltzing Matilda was uh, uh, written by the Australian um, poet Banjo Patterson in 1895. It's often referred to as Australia's unofficial the national anthem. And it was also sung by the first diggers. It has been set to many different tunes, but the most popular of which you are now invited to sit back and sing. Thank you very much. Over to you. Join in and sing this great Australian song in the spirit that would have been whistled by the diggers way back in World War One. Once a jolly swagman hanging by a big under the shade of the cool of the tree, and he sang as he watched.
grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we shall remember them. Lest we forget. Ladies and gentlemen, the doves. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, that uh, concludes our service this morning. The procedure from here, all of the uh, children who participated in this morning's service shall receive a small memento from the sub-branch for their services to us. And I think they've done a marvellous job. Well done. What a community we've got up here, ladies and gentlemen. I've never seen this place so packed. It's fantastic. And once again, thanks very, very much for your attendance. And thanks for your community spirit for coming along here today. What we have after um, this particular thing, we have breakfast being served in the room behind me. Please make, um, make yourself available. There shall be refreshments. For those who are getting a little bit of a dry throat, a uh, coffee and tea, of course, um, uh, uh, for those who wish to participate. But once again, sincerely, for the organisers, for the choir, for the caterers, for all the helpers, and us, thank you very much. Thank you. That's what you think about.